This is the story of British Airways Flight 56. The British Airways 747 fleet was something that the world lost to the pandemic. During the illustrious career that the plane had with the British flag carrier, the jet has seen its fair share of praise, fame, and also near misses. This is one of those stories. On the 11th of May 2009, a British Airways 747-400 was on the ground at OR Tambo International Airport in Johannesburg, South Africa. The jumbo jet had 265 passengers, 15 crew members, and three pilots on board. The mission today was to take the plane to Heathrow. The pilots calculated the parameters for the takeoff, like the V1, VR, and V2 speeds. V1 is the speed at which you can no longer safely abort the takeoff with the runway you have remaining. After V1, you are committed to taking off, or you're going to overrun the runway. VR is the speed at which you begin to rotate the nose of the plane into the air, and V2 is the minimum speed which must be maintained until a certain altitude should you lose an engine. These numbers are very important as a pilot will be making life or death decisions with these numbers. Based on the weight, atmospheric conditions, and all of those things, the V1, VR, and V2 spades came out to 150, 168, and 176 knots, respectively. Today's takeoff would be a reduced thrust takeoff. The four Rolls-Royce RB211 engines of the 747-400 were able to crank out 58,000 pounds of thrust each. From my back of the napkin math, that's about 900 Dacia Sand Arrows from each engine. So, you don't need to firewall the throttles for most takeoffs. This saves on fuel and wear and tear on the engine. Tonight was one of those days. With that, Speedbird 56 was ready to rumble. The first officer lined the Queen of the Skies onto runway 03 left. More than 4 kilometers of runway stretched out in front of them. It was go time. The four engines spooled up and the 747 started rolling down the runway. As the runway lights streaked by faster and faster, the pilots got the shock of their lives. At 125 knots, on the P2 Pilot Center Instruments panel, there was an ICAST message under engine number 3. It just said RIF, or REV, I don't know how you pronounce that. But what this meant was that the reverser had somehow deployed on engine number 3. For those of you that don't know, planes can break in a number of ways when on the ground. You can, well, you know, use the brakes the spoilers, and the reverser. The reversers are designed to redirect the thrust of the engine in the direction of trap. That is, reversing it. This is so that the jet has some extra braking oomph when slowing down on a runway. For reasons that should be obvious, a reverser activating on takeoff is a very, very, very bad thing. Then, seconds later, the same message showed up under engine number two. They now had two reversers deployed. They were well past the V1 speed at 159 knots. They were committed to this takeoff. At 173 knots, the huge jet started to climb into the dark sky. Right off the bat, the pilots were wrestling with the plane. The stick shaker came on, letting them know that they were on the verge of stalling out. They had just left the runway, but they might crash back down. The first officer then felt something that you really shouldn't be feeling on a 747. The plane was buffeting. The first officer, being an aerobatic pilot, was quite familiar with the feeling, but now he'd have to dig deep into his aerobatic experience to keep this jumbo jet in the air. The captain was calling out their altitude above the ground as the first officer fought to keep the plane from stalling. The pilots retracted the gear and the plane seemed to stabilize a bit, and then the jet started to climb. Their problems were seemingly behind them. The plane's performance had mysteriously returned. But the pilots were understandably concerned. They took the jet up to 7,000 feet and declared a pan pan pan, noting that they had engine troubles on engines 2 and 3. But with the jet being fueled for an intercontinental voyage to London, it was far too heavy to land back at Johannesburg. So ATC cleared the jet to climb up to 15,000 feet, dump some fuel, and then at 8 p.m., the 747 touched back down at Oratambo International Airport on runway 03 right. Their two-hour ordeal was over, and they had one question. What just happened? Before we get into that, I feel that this flight could have been so much more worse had it not been for the pilot flying. Sure, the danger was brief for about 30 seconds, 
but it is super easy to lose control of a giant plane in a low energy state so close to the ground. I wonder how a pilot without the aerobatic background of the first officer would have done. If you have any thoughts, let me know in the comments below. Once this jet was handed over to the technicians, the first thing that they did was to check the quick access recorder. The QAR is a secondary data recorder that is used to collect data about the plane for maintenance and operational efficiency. Think of it as a pared down flight data recorder that's much more low stakes. The thing is, the QARs record a lot of information at much higher frequencies than the flight data recorder. When they pulled in data from the QAR, it showed clear as day that both reversers deployed within seconds of each other. They decided to compare the TRCP values from the flight data recorder to the QAR. By the way, the TRCP stands for Thrust Reverser Cal Position. Ideally, you want the flight data recorder and the QAR to match. In this case, it did not. You see, the engine has a TRCP value that tells you how much it's deployed. Each engine has a TRCP value. The values for engine 2 and 3 came out to 8.25%. As per the maintenance documents of the RB211, when the reversers are stowed, that value should be between 3 and 5%. But a value of 8.25 absolutely proves that the reversers did not deploy in flight like the crew thought. If the reversers had actually deployed, that value would have been much, much higher. So, what's going on here? Now, I could just tell you that there was a flaw in the thrust reverser system and consider this case solved. But that's not why you watch my videos. So let's dig into the thrust reverser mechanism on the RB211. When the thrust reverser is commanded to retract, the reverser is pushed forward until it hits a seal at the forward end of its travel. This movement of the reverser is controlled by a thrust reverser air motor, which uses the pressure in the pneumatic supply duct. So if the pneumatic supply duct pressure wasn't up to snuff, then it wouldn't be able to push the reverser cowlings all the way forward. Unfortunately, the thrust reverser position with the low air pressure wasn't checked on the ground at Johannesburg, but the pressure in the pneumatic system was shown to be 11 psi, as opposed to 14 psi. So the mechanics fixed the pneumatic system, and then they gave the reversers another go. And lo and behold, the reversers closed all the way, this time, the TRCP values were 2.3 for both engines, exactly where they should be. On the accident takeoff, since the reversers were further back than usual, the stow sensors thought that the reversers were deploying and thus sent a command to the computer, telling the computer that the reversers on engine 2 and 3 were in the process of being deployed. This is where the flaps come into play. Now, you might be wondering, this is an engine issue, why do we care about the flaps? Well, so far, all we've uncovered is that we have a spurious reverser signal, nothing that would prevent the plane from climbing out normally. Keep in mind, the reversers didn't actually deploy. That is where the flaps come in, specifically the leading edge flaps. There are 28 leading edge flaps, 14 on each wing. These are further divided into variable camber and Kruger flaps. So here's the thing about the 747. When the reversers are engaged, Group A leading edge flaps will automatically be retracted. This is to prevent them from being damaged by the air that's kicked up by the reverser. This means that if there's a reverse unlock signal sent, the flaps go in no matter what. Right before the jet took off, the leading edge flaps retracted because the computer thought that the reversers had deployed. With that, the stall speed of the jet was much higher. That's why the pilots had such a hard time climbing out. That is also why the plane came so close to a stall despite the engines producing a normal amount of thrust for this takeoff. All of this begs the question, why didn't they crash? Well, it turned out to be the retraction of the gear. When the gear was retracted, the flaps came out and the emergency ended. I guess the software recognizes that you can't have the reversers open in flight and that killed the reverser and gauge signal, which allowed the flaps to come out. The thing is, as random and as far-fetched as all of these events seem, this has happened before. On another 747 during takeoff, someone left an object near the ICAST screen and it hit the throttles and this caused a retraction of the leading edge flaps, just like on flight 56. 
So, on the 13th of March, 1997, Boeing put out the service bulletin titled 747-27A2356, great name by the way, which was issued to prevent the accidental auto retraction of the leading edge flaps on takeoff. But this change did not foresee the events that Flight 56 went through, and so the code wasn't able to handle this brand new situation. Because no one ever foresaw something like this from ever happening. What can I tell you? Murphy's Law always wins. Before I wrap up, I want to go over two things. One, in the additional safety recommendations, they bring up how automated planes are these days, and by these days they're talking about 2009, the same year the iPhone 3GS came out, and how pilots are ill-equipped to handle these software failures. Two points caught my eye. Quote, Review the processes used to introduce modifications to control software since issuance of the original type certification. Example, consider a recertification process. And improve the robustness of the software slash hardware logic through the introduction of additional parameters to consider prior to an automatic change of critical control surfaces. End quote. Can you think of another Boeing plane whose development and certification could have used these principles? Yeah, this report was ahead of its time, I guess. The second thing that I wanted to bring up was the crew and the exceptionally good job that they did. Here's a quote from the report. The flying crew should be commended for the professional way that they control the aircraft during a critical stage during takeoff. During the incident, the flight crew had no indication or understanding of what had caused the lack of performance in the aircraft. End quote. Thank God the first officer had some aerobatic training. He sure used all of it that day. I searched high and low for the names of the pilots, but unfortunately I couldn't find them. Which is a shame, because I'd love to buy the guys a beer. Well, that's it for this video. If you want to watch another video about a Boeing 777 also struggling to take off, I'll put that video up on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.